Hello, and welcome to the three o'clock track three talk. You have one new opponent, hacking proprietary IA calendar uh, properties by Eugene Lim. Before we begin, I have two announcements. Number one, please wear your masks while you're, in, while you're sitting in the room, that's, they're still required. And number two, please don't sit around or stand around the edge of the room. Please come in and find a seat, come on a little closer and check out this talk. Welcome Eugene. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. I know it's day two of DEF CON, so you guys have survived. Uh, you guys just have to survive my talk and one more day and you guys will be home free. So thank you very much for coming and I'm really excited to speak today. Uh, I'll be talking about you have one new appointment, uh, hacking proprietary iCalendar properties. And before I begin, I just want to give a quick introduction to myself. Uh, I'm Eugene and I go by Space Raccoon Online. Um, I, that's my Twitter handle because someone has a Twitter handle for Space Raccoon. So if you're that guy, come up to me, we can work something out after this. Um, you know, I can't pay much, but we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, I work at the cybersecurity group at the Government Technology Agency of Singapore. So I'm from Singapore and what I do is mostly DevSecOps. Um, I work on protecting citizen data and government systems and applications before they get out into the public. Um, yeah. So how many of you guys have gotten a appointment reminder in the last week or so? You know, maybe a ping, a mobile notification. Yeah, most of you guys do because especially in the COVID, post-COVID or well, you know, era, you know, we have a lot of calendars invitations kind of floating around reminding you to go for something or another. And you might be wondering what's going on behind the scenes, right? When you get an invitation and you have that little convenient button in Outlook that says accept the invitation or decline the invitation, what's happening, right? Or in your Apple calendar or your iOS device, you might also have that convenient button. So what really happens when you get an invitation and it pops up? And you might also wonder what happens if instead of just accepting an invitation uh, or, you know, checking out an application uh, invitation they've gotten, what happens if you started doing something strange, right? Your mobile phone starts having a few pop-ups. Uh, you might start a call. Uh, something might be going on in the background and you don't start the meeting, right? Um, instead, a shell or something might have uh, started. So what really goes on behind the scenes when you have an invitation like that is that you have an email with an ICS attachment, which is the iCalendar attachment. And before we carry on, I just want to clarify, I think maybe a misconception some might have, is that iCalendar is not explicitly an uh, Apple format, you know, because you might think iPhone, iPad, but the iCalendar format is actually the name for a standardized format uh, defined by RSC that's interoperable between various uh, email and, and calendar clients from Microsoft Outlook to Google Calendar uh, to Apple Calendar. And it's something I'm going to dive a bit more into because uh, for those of you in red teams, you might be pretty familiar with using uh, calendar invitations as a phishing lure. And that's something that a lot of people have done. But what I was more interested in was looking into exploit scenarios with the iCalendar format. Uh, ways that it could be used and abused, ways that passes can be broken, you know, to get an exploit out. And this was fairly fruitful research even though I threw the net pretty wide. So this kind of covered a number of vulnerabilities from VMware Boxer to Synology Calendar, Apple Calendar, Microsoft Outlook, Google Calendar, and Nextcloud Calendar. So if you look at the list of um, targets, it's actually a fairly broad range because it went from mobile to web to desktop to IoT devices. And this really shows you, even from a very brief survey that I did um, across, you know, every single client I could get my hands on. Uh, I didn't really go too deep into one or another, that you can find a lot of interesting things. And this brought up a few interesting ideas. So we really have to begin, I think, uh, about 24 years now, back in 1998, when the RFC 2445, which is the Internet Calendar uh, Object Specification, was first published by two guys, uh, Dawson from... Um, uh, uh, from Lotus and also Stanerson from Microsoft. And what these guys came out with was basically a format for the iCalendar uh, specification, uh, which would define an event or calendar that could be shared between various Office applications. And back in 1998, that was the context was that it was a huge uh, Office uh, wars, right? Because all of these companies were coming out with their own office suites. You know, they were creating their own specifications, their own way of doing things, and they're not all compatible with each other. But this is a terrible thing for the end user because it doesn't make sense if you as a user have an event and you're inviting someone uh, and it doesn't matter what kind of client they're using or what kind of application they're using, you want them to be able to accept your invite and attend it. 
But if you're all using different formats, that's not going to work out, right? So that's what these companies did. They came together, built a format, and they decided to use that as a standard uh, operating uh, format between each of them. And so that's really the, the plan they have for today. I'm going to give you kind of a background to the iCalendar format, uh, some interesting things that might have came up in my research, and what, uh, what, what people might have exploited, before diving into standard implementations of iCalendar that are not so standard. So even though you have a standard, I think you'll be more than familiar that companies don't do things that way. Um, they have uh, used it in very interesting and strange ways that have led to vulnerabilities. And then I'll move on to proprietary extensions to the iCalendar standard. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later. But basically, the iCalendar standard supports a non-standard way, a standard way of doing non-standard things. So companies can add their own extensions, um, their way of parsing, and that's going to be supported by the format. And then finally, I'll talk about some protocol interactions because iCalendar doesn't exist in a, a vacuum. Uh, when you respond to an invitation, an email is being sent, so it's working with the SMTP format. There's also the CalDev format uh, uh, protocol, which helps to update and create calendar uh, files on the web servers. And, and that's all kind of things that add additional complexity to using iCalendar and has led to vulnerabilities. And I'll give some takeaways, quick takeaways, mostly for builders, uh, but also for breakers. If you're interested, I'll be also putting up a small database of these stuff that I found uh, that you can also take it a bit further. Because as I mentioned, I've done a really broad survey, found really kind of surface level stuff. But from what I've seen, I think if you want to take it further, there's definitely a rich source of bugs. All right. So Let's start with the background for the iCalendar standard. So I showed you the 2445 RFC. That was way back in 1998. And it was kind of superseded by what is 5545, which was in 2009, uh, done by someone from Oracle. And more recently, well, we have seen also a couple more updates. Uh, uh, more re the most recent one also from Apple, an uh, engineer from Apple. But you also have a bunch of other RFCs that kind of update or add kind of interoperability, uh, things that basically uh, extend the format to more platforms. But when you're thinking about the iCalendar format, you really want to go with IRC 5545 because that's a core specification that tells you exactly what goes on into this format. All right, so that's enough of talking of the IRC. So what actually goes on in a calendar, right? You get a calendar invite, what's going on? You get an email with an ICS attachment. And what does that ICS attachment look like? Um, um, so, so that's what it kind of looks like. Uh, it's a pretty interesting format, a very simple format, something that you might come up with uh, back in 1998 when you had a lot of space uh, and network restrictions. It's a text file, uh, comma delimited and new line delimited. And it's a bit similar to, say, XML because there are some opening and closing tags. Uh, you have the opening of a V calendar and you have opening of a V event. And those are things that uh, are similar to XML. But it's also different from XML because it also has key value pairs, right? You have stuff like the date, type, date time start, uh, the end, the location, the URL. And these are all standard properties that help describe the event you're attending. And in the background, what uh, the clients are doing are essentially passing this transparently to the user. So as a user, most of the time, you're not going to see an ICS file. You might have seen that if you have been sending an invite to a separate email client. But you're sending it within the Outlook ecosystem, for example. What you're going to see is a very uh, streamlined and uh, transparent kind of uh, user interface, right? And what these clients are doing is that they're doing some proprietary work in the background. They are parsing it differently from other clients. They are also adding their own extensions. And this creates more features because um, these companies, they want to differentiate their products. So you might have gotten a very convenient join online button if you had a, a team meeting or a Skype meeting. And what's going on back there is that Outlook is actually passing, for example, the URL property or maybe the uh, uh, a custom proprietary property that defines a Teams meeting URL, and that's going to immediately appear in the GUI. So that's already pretty interesting because uh, just by modifying some of these uh, unstructured data, you can create changes in the GUI and also the behavior of these applications. You might have uh, a flight scheduled tomorrow. I hope it stays on time. Um, but basically, when you have a flight and it comes in as an email, for example, Apple Mail is able to pass that intelligently, uh, extract some of the features, and suggest an event for you, right? And a lot of this data is actually going to be in Apple's proprietary uh, data format. So it can show you things like uh, your travel time. It can do a bit of a tracking of the flight for you and the calendar. And that's all very convenient for the end user. But with that convenience, it comes some complexity. Uh, and for bug hunters, I think that's where the bugs happen. 
So back in, I think, 1998, there was some dangerous by default uh, stuff in the specification. And one of these is the V-alarm uh, V alarm property, right? So you can specify an alarm or trigger that happens maybe 15 minutes or one hour before your event happens, and you can pop it in different ways. Uh, the most obvious way is, of course, the notification way. So it's just going to pop up a box or something. But back then, they actually allowed for several other ways to create a notification. One of them is that you could specify an email that could also have an attachment from your local, for, uh, local system. So when it's time for the event, it's going to send an email to who knows what uh, with whatever attachment you have specified in your local system. Or you could even play a, a sound, a special sound. So you could load that from an FTP server or HTTP server in a remote server. And we can see why that is, might be an issue today because you, know, you could play something nasty or dangerous and you don't want that to be loading remote content without your consent. Uh, and that was something that would have been possible given the way iCalendar works because a lot of these systems, they just take in the iCalendar file and they automatically add that to your calendar without you even having to accept it. But that was back in 1998. Um, and I think a lot of companies and also the new updated RFCs, they have kind of noted uh, these dangerous by default stuff. They've kind of deprecated it. But there's still insecure implementations of standard RFC properties. Uh, and I'll go through, them, through some of them. They're really interesting. So the first one is the description property. And it's as simple as it gets. It's exactly what it says on the tin. It just describes the event that you're going for. And it's meant to be a raw text um, file. right? Uh, it, it just adds in a little more data about what's going on with your event. But even though it describes it as a raw text file, I think vendors implement this very differently. Um, so Apple and Microsoft, you know, they stuck to the specification. They interpret that as plain text. But Google and VMware, they actually interpret this as HTML. So if you can, you can actually include HTML tags, and it will be passed as such. Um, Google itself does have their own sanitization procedures. You might be familiar with those. Uh, VMware did not for one of the applications. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the reason why this is a problem is just because of the way ICS works. Um, for a lot of clients, they automatically add the ICS attachment to your calendar. So even if you haven't accepted it or declined it, it's going to appear in your calendar or your inbox, right? And it's going to be added as a non-blocking event until you respond to it, but it's going to be there. And because of that, you can trigger a payload remotely without any user interaction, um, depending on, of course, the, uh, the exploit scenario that you have as well. Uh, and that's something that's pretty concerning. And also what makes it tricky is that, you know, you have so many clients across different platforms, different frameworks, that makes it really difficult to secure your implementation. So for VMware, that was an interesting case uh, because only the iOS application was vulnerable, whereas Android has a different way of handling web views, and that was able to kind of sanitize it and kind of uh, block the exploitation. Whereas if you look at stuff like what Microsoft is putting out, they do have Microsoft Teams, Windows Calendar, uh, Outlook, Outlook on the web. Uh, they have mobile, desktop, all kinds of things. And this makes it a lot messier for you to secure things at the endpoint. And this is something I've observed as well, where it kind of pays to kind of test across different platforms and different uh, uh, versions in order to get what you want to see. What's interesting as well is not just raw text parsing. Uh, Apple does something really weird with um, the, this, this format because while they stick to raw text, they actually add their own um, special template into this, right? So it has a magic template, magic bytes. Um, and if you're creating an a application uh, event with uh, like a FaceTime call, what it actually does behind the scenes is that it puts in this uh, FaceTime uh, uh, format template, and it transparently interprets that in your client. So if you're going to look at that on your mobile phone or in macOS, it's just going to show you a simple join button. At this point, you're kind of like, OK, yeah. Uh, you know, custom URIs are also a thing. Um, so Apple back then didn't sanitize it. And this is also a concern because I think, you know, in the start of 2022, I think uh, Ryan Pick Pick Pickering had a, a really good uh, UXSS or custom URI to RCE exploit on macOS. So this would have been a great delivery mechanism for that kind of uh, vulnerability. Um, and, and really, I think uh, when it comes to a lot of the properties I've seen that involve a URL, some of them do not uh, check for the custom URI or protocol. And that's where you can also put in an exploit. Another interesting property for me was the attendee or organizer property. And what's interesting about this is that it's also tied to how you respond to it, right? Because when you respond to an email saying you're attending or not attending, it refers to the organizer field and it's going to send an uh, invitation 
uh, uh, response to that organizer. And then the server at the end of it is going to accept the invitation uh, and then it's going to send an update to all of the invited participants. So according to the RFC, this value is a URI and has to be a mail to URI uh, defined by another RFC, right? Um, and sure, you're like, okay, that's fine. That looks good to me. Um, but I think for those of you who looked at RFCs, uh, uh, my condolences. Uh, for those of you who read RFCs, um, you know, that's a valid RFC approved email actually because you put it between double quotes, it allows special characters and that's where you can also inject some of your payloads that are going to be used by the application. So this was something I saw with uh, the Synology calendar itself. So for example, when you add uh, an event and I'm just kind of importing it here but you can have it synced from a calendar or from someone inviting you, uh, that's going to cause, you know, a payload, right? And that's going to pop. <laughs> Yeah, um, and you can create a warmable event from this basically because it's a calendar and then everyone's invited to the party. And it's not a good party, it's the bad party. The kind that you don't want to go to at, you know, I hope you've gone to better parties, that's DEF CON. Um, yeah, and also some of the behavior that Apple does is also very custom, very proprietary. It's a non-standard way of implementing the uh, specification that's really interesting. So for a calendar, uh, they also have an attached property. Uh, and the attached property basically defines, you know, most of the time it's, it has to be a local to your email itself. But you can also sometimes specify a URL. Uh, most clients do not support that. Uh, but this URL specifies uh, attachment to your event. So stuff like maybe a meeting agenda or a cat picture or something. Um, and what Apple does is that it checks if this URL ends with .icloud.com. And if it does, it's going to automatically download that to your computer. Uh, and this might be useful for red teams. I mean, uh, I, I think it follows iCloud.com, but it also follows redirects. So you can load any of your remote data into someone's computer remotely. So it's a zero click download, I guess. Um, and that might be useful for some red teams. Um, it also does, uh, if, if it's on .icloud.com, you can basically sign up for an iCloud uh, a folder and you can also upload that and that's going to work with everyone. So it might be convenient for the end user because it helps them quickly attach stuff to iCloud and send it to each other, but it's also useful if you want to deliver a payload. So that's it for kind of the standard properties that we've looked at. Um, and one of the other things that I started to look at was the proprietary extensions to iCalendar. And that really makes the meat of kind of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I love it when companies do things differently because then, you know, bugs happen. And the RFC has a specification that allows for a standard mechanism for doing non-standard things. And what that means is that if you want to add your own functionality, you want to add your own custom property that's not in the RFC, something a little extra, you can just add X in front of that and that's going to be taken up as a non-standard property. And there's no registration authority for this. So it's kind of the wild, wild west, right? Um, you can maybe add like X, I want to start an app. And if your client is able to uh, look for that property and it passes that property, that's good for you, right? It's just not going to be compatible with other clients that don't support that property. And in the bad old days when the um, office applications were fighting for dominance, um, I think Microsoft went ham with this. Um, so this was a really interesting uh, custom property that I saw with Microsoft Office. Um, they had this auto start check uh, property, custom property, and they also had the collaborate doc property. And what the auto start check property did was that when it's time for the event, it's going to automatically start the video conferencing uh, app, right? And the collaborate doc uh, property, it just opens any file uh, when it's time to start the conference. So this was interesting, but it's, it's no longer supported in uh, more recent versions of uh, Outlook. So I had to perform a bit of necromancy, right? I had to <laughs> find my, uh, Windows XP, uh, get uh, Office 2003, and it did work as described, right? Uh, I, a attacker would send an invitation with an ICS file um, with these properties set and immediately trigger opening any file, even a remote loaded file, uh, on the victim's uh, desktop. And you might see why that's a problem today because when we have Zoom or, or some other video conferencing applications today, uh, that's a huge concern. You don't want a rando to send you a calendar attachment and somehow suddenly your Zoom pops up and you start talking to them uh, or they start listening to you, right? Um, but this goes to show that even back then, there were different considerations for the properties that uh, companies were creating and this led to some issues. So yeah, you're saying, okay, that's all in the past, that's all dead history, right? But we still have zombie properties coming up and they still exist because 
you know, there's stuff like backward compatibility, the difficulty of dealing with legacy code um, makes it difficult to fully excise some of these uh, old properties. So Microsoft does have another uh, property called MWS URL, Meeting Workspace URL. And Meeting Workspaces, uh, if you've used Office in maybe like five, ten years ago, maybe have been a bigger thing. But basically it's kind of a previous iteration of the uh, meeting uh, stuff that Microsoft did. Nowadays we have Teams, we have Skype, but this was something that happened back then. And this had really interesting behavior uh, because when you have this property existing in your event uh, and you respond to the event, uh, what it's going to do is going to take that URL and it's going to send a SOAP message to that. And depending on how you respond, the application is also going to behave in pretty strange ways. Um, so, so that's something you can look at as well. Another thing is that it's, it's going to show this in the, UR, in the GUI as a view meeting workspace button. And if you have kind of played around with Outlook in the past or Office applications, you would know that Microsoft actually um, sanitizes a lot of custom URIs. Uh, it does this automatically. It pops up an alert if you're going to click that saying, oh, it's not HTTP or something like that. Um, but this was able to kind of bypass the check, I guess because it was much older code in the code base. Um, unfortunately, this was like two months before for Lina, so I wasn't able to use that for the full chain. Um, but this is another example of where uh, it would be really nice if you guys told me your custom URI exploits. Um, that would be really helpful. Okay, so that's Microsoft, Apple. Google patented it, their custom property. Uh, Google patented a way to iframe widgets in your calendars. So some of you guys might have used Calendar Classic. You might have used uh, uh, Google homepage back in the day. And that was really fun, you know, adding random widgets to your homepage. Um, and what Google wanted to do was that they wanted people to have a way to have a word of the day in their calendar. Or maybe, you know, uh, who's famous, which famous person's birthday is it today? Because people like that. And when you can see from the graphic over there, that's what it's supposed to look like. It's basically an iframe in your calendar. And how that works in the background is that it is another custom property called X Google Calendar Content. And that means you can load remote content. You can load an uh, image as well as an iframe URL. And in today's context, that's also a bad thing, right? When you receive an email, most of the time these days, the clients are not going to load the remote content immediately because that is a privacy concern. We think about tracking pixels, we think about de-anonymization, um, but this was not the case for this. And also when it comes to iframes, um, iframes are also an issue because when you want to securely display an iframe these days, you, you, most of the time you're going to put them in a sandbox to disable scripts, stuff like that, um, but Google doesn't do that. So while Google Classic doesn't exist today, Google Cla Calendar Classic doesn't exist today, um, Classics never die. Um, uh, there are still parts of Google Calendar that still use this, that still um, display this. I think they patched this, uh, but this is on Google Embedded Calendar. And various parts of uh, the Google, you're going to find this pop up and it's going to work. And that's great because, say, for example, if you're going to view the calendar, that's going to pop some dynamic scripts or content for you. Right, um, and that's going to be an issue as well because end users are not going to be aware of what's actually happening. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you can load this all fully remotely without user interaction. One interesting thing that Apple is also doing with custom properties is that it's actually jerry-rigging its own data structures onto iCalendar. So while browsing, say, one of my uh, scheduled events, uh, flight events on my iCalendar, I notice a couple of things. I notice X Apple. Uh, uh, properties, one of which is the pipe delimited uh, uh, format. Uh, that, that added a bit more rich information to my event. But I also notice X Apple structured data. And that was basically a base64 string that decoded into the binary property list format. So for those of you who are more familiar with macOS internals, that is basically a proprietary uh, uh, Apple uh, format that can be decoded further into the property list format. And the property list format can be decoded further into XML. Right. So you have four layers of abstraction, four layers of parsing, and four layers of decoding in iCalendar. That is pretty interesting. And if you look at it, the XML basically con contains your flight reservation information. Um, and there were some interesting things you could do to uh, tweak what's displayed on the calendar. But basically, this also is supported remotely. So if you're going to send someone a calendar invite and it contains all of these properties, that's also going to be rendered in their, uh, in their application. And this leads to a lot of problems. So I haven't dug too deep into this, but I would definitely fuzz this a lot more, um, given 
given the, the various layers of parsing, and I would definitely recommend that uh, people look at this. And next, uh, I'm going to talk about interactions with SMTP and CalDev. So, given that um, the Apple calendar, uh, iCalendar format has uh, all of these, these uh, properties, it doesn't actually work in a vacuum. So, as I mentioned earlier, when you accept an invitation on, say, Outlook or another application, what it really does is that your client is going to um, send an email with an ICS attachment via whichever protocol it uses. Most of the time it's going to SMTP, but maybe if you're doing it on a web app, it's going to have its own custom API call to HTTP. And it's going to send it to the organizer property. And the organizer is going to pass that in their server. It's going to update their own calendar invitation. And it's going to send it out to all of the other uh, invites uh, so that they know who is attending this uh, event. So my good friend uh, Indy, when I was discussing this with him, um, he's really has done some good work in the mailbox space. Um, you might wonder what happens to that organizer property, right? So for that property, uh, it's going to be an email, and it's going to paste that in an SMTP conversation. Uh, SMTP commands basically have uh, a new line delimited kind of commands. It's kind of like a FTP session, if you think about it. It starts with the handshake, uh, it starts with mail from, and it's going to paste that organizer property value into the receipt to uh, command. So who that email is going to go to. And Inti had this great suggestion. He said, how about new lines? When I, went, when I heard that, I was like, yeah, how about new lines? Because <laughs> if you deal with uh, protocols and, and uh, formats, this is kind of the first thing you kind of look out for. And it's true, because you can craft a RFC compliant email address with new lines. And this allows you to inject basically new SMTP commands. So instead of just when a person, a victim kind of accepts the invitation, instead of sending an email to the organizer, or so they think, uh, what's going to happen is that you can inject their own SMTP email. So they can send an email somewhere else. Uh, they might forge an email on your behalf and so on. Um, so thanks, Inti. That was a nice one. And the impact of this really depends on the SMTP server support. Uh, I guess because some of them do have uh, soft failure modes. Some of them do have additional commands that you can use. But generally speaking, when it comes to SMTP injection, you can modify, say, the sender, the receiver, the contents of your email. And this can lead to some pretty interesting uh, or terrible interactions uh, with, with your victim. Another interesting protocol that uh, iCalendar interacts with is CalDev. So CalDev is a superset of WebDev which is itself a superset of HTTP. And if you, you, if you intercept the request from your iPhone or maybe your Mac OS, you're actually going to see a lot of this because Apple still uses CalDev to sync uh, calendar objects between your phone and its servers, the iCloud servers. And it's really kind of a legacy format because uh, it was used back in the day, again, when uh, syncing between servers wasn't proprietary and people wanted to make it work. Uh, maybe you might have one email client from Yahoo Mail and you want to sync it with your Outlook Mail, right? So all of them used CalDev uh, back then. Uh, and companies didn't like that. Uh, they don't want things to be compatible uh, nowadays because you know, they have market power. Uh, Google tried to deprecate it, I think, about five years ago. And uh, uh, basically, the developers kind of rose up and complained about it. So they said, OK, we won't deprecate it. We'll try it next year. Um, so in the documentation, they have been saying they're going to deprecate it for a couple years now. Uh, it hasn't really been totally phased out, uh, but it's still there. Microsoft itself, uh, if you're familiar with Azure and stuff, uh, they work with the graph, the new uh, graph protocol, uh, and that basically creates objects using JSON. Um, but they still use CalDev in some of their, back, uh, their backward compatibility uh, with clients. LockSuite is an application created by ByteDance, and they do have uh, support for CalDev, but it's read-only. I think mostly because they use their own proprietary APIs to update events, but they use uh, the read-only CalDev in order to have compatibility with different mail clients. So when you look at it, uh, CalDev just provides you with an additional way to inject your properties. Uh, when it came to, say, um, uh, Google, uh, it was a bit difficult for me to bypass, say, their HTTP API to inject some of my payloads into a calendar object. But when I used the CalDev uh, protocol, I was able to just inject it without much problems. So if you're working with CalDev and you're working with iCalendar, you might also want to consider using CalDev as a way to deliver your payloads without having to deal with the hassle of uh, some kind of proprietary API or uh, file format. And that was something that was really interesting to me. 
yeah, so, so that kind of sums up the uh, number of the bugs that I've, I've put out there. And um, you might want to think, what's going, what can you do as a user or a creator, a developer of the iCalendar format? So in my opinion, it seems like what vendors are doing is that the evolution of iCalendar is going to be more jerry-rigging, right? What we see here with Microsoft is a, kind of a bridge between the iCalendar format and their graph API. Um, so basically, it's a JSON nested in iCalendar. And that's basically another type and uh, that's basically another key value format em embedded within another key value format. Um, a lot of these companies are doing this. They're basically adding their own uh, ways of parsing uh, special templates special encoding that's being put in the value format, so it's no longer just a pure raw text format. But you can see again how this is an interesting uh, uh, attack vector, because once you have these additional parsing, you can also do uh, pretty interesting injections, depending on what's going on back then. And you might also think, how can you secure this, right, given that you have so many clients from so many different platforms and frameworks. And for Microsoft, what they've done is uh, they've created their own internal parsing standards. They call it the iCalendar to Appointment Object Conversion Algorithm. And it basically is a standard way for them to pass these from iCalendar into uh, calendar or event object. Uh, and this is, I think, not a bad way to do things, uh, especially if you have a huge number of clients and most of your customers are going to be using the, the clients anyway, not kind of bridging between different clients. Another uh, option is to contribute to open parsing standards. And this is something that I would recommend people do. Um, I know the Apple's engineer has pushed out a couple of RC RFCs in this front, but this helps to kind of secure things across the entire ecosystem. Uh, and because I think the RFC for calendar, iCalendar, is not yet complete, there's still a lot of things missing in how you're parsing or dealing with the iCalendar format that needs security considerations, especially since it was written in uh, 1998 and 2009. Um, there are a lot of things that are missing in terms of modern uh, privacy and security standards. And of course, I think as a developer, you want to stay frugal with non-standard behavior, right? Back in the early 2000s, companies went wild with uh, custom properties because, you know, they love widgets. We love um, all of these kind of shiny extras. But what I've seen is also that a lot of these things are really hard to get out of your system once you support it, right? Because you need to have backward compatibility. You also need to have um, some of your legacy code that might be hard to exercise. And that's, uh, I think Google was a kind of case in point because it might not exist in uh, modern Google Calendar, but it still exists in other parts of the website uh, that other people can still access and is not ideal. And so for researchers, um, there's still a lot more properties to research. Um, I, am, I have uh, uh, open source the database right now uh, for some of these properties. I've only put up a couple right now, but I think tomorrow I'm gonna put up the rest. Uh, I would really appreciate any contributions to this as we dive into our calendar standard, especially since for the end users themselves, they might not be aware what's going on behind the scenes, and that's always a concern, right? Because it's doing all these flashy stuff. Um, it's not always compatible. Uh, most of it is not compatible. Uh, most of it is going to break when you move between uh, standards, and a lot of it is not documented. So I think it really helps to kind of document some of these custom properties, uh, whether if you're a builder or a breaker, that's going to help us out a lot. So yeah, that's my, uh, that's my URL, and hopefully you can see some contributions. So thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your attention. Uh, I have some, thank you.